Thank you for joining us today. My name is Kelly Timko. I'm from Galarath. I'm going to be your moderator for today's Lunch and Learn. Welcome to Building Best in Class Costing Systems, and Karen McRitchie is our presenter today. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to learn something new with us. All the lines have been placed on mute to avoid any background noise. So if you have any questions or you need anything, you can use the chat function to speak with me. Today's training is brought to you by Galarath, and Galarath is a leader in analytical program management, empowering analysts and organizational leaders to make complex business decisions with confidence through the use of predictive analytics. And of course, you can find Galarath on the web at galarath.com. Please stick around after the presentation for the Q&A period. This will be your opportunity to ask questions and make this um, directly relevant to you and your, and your needs. We'll uh, also be providing a link at the end of, uh, of a post event survey so that you can give us your feedback. On Thursday of next week, we'll be giving away a $100 Amazon gift card from the pool of people who answer that survey. So please take a moment and, and do that. If you're from a government agency and you're unable to accept a gift card, we're also happy to donate that amount to a local charity if you're selected. Um, if you know anyone else on your team or your organization who should be joining us today, you can send them to galarath.live and there's a registration link provided there. That would be G-A-L-O-R-A-T-H dot live. Um, as well, all the handouts from this presentation, um, the PDF version of the deck and a link to the video once it's ready will also be posted at galarath.live. Um, our May webinar topic is going to be driven by your input um, on that survey. So be sure you take a couple minutes to answer those, that question. Um, and then you'll be able to watch your inbox for the announcement of what the topic will be for May. And registration for that will also be at galbath.live. So we have a lot of information uh, on, that, on that website. Today's training is being recorded and it will be available for later viewing on demand. And we'll be sending the URL to everybody who registered and you may feel free to share that link with any of your teammates as well. So let's get started. Today's presenter is Karen McRitchie. She is the VP of Development at Galarath Incorporated. Karen has been with Galarath for over 30 years and she leads all the work related to the SEER product line. She comes from a software development and mathematical modeling background and has worked in the all domains of cost estimation. Um, in addition, as an advocate for costing professionals, she's constantly seeking new and innovative methods to improve the state of the cost estimating and analysis practice. So with that, I'm going to turn over the presentation to Karen. Thanks, Kelly, and thanks everyone for joining us today. So why talk about costing systems? There's certainly a lot of emphasis on specific tools and estimating methods, and that's really important. However, today I kind of wanted to bring um, the idea of costing as a system in general up as, as it encompasses not just the tools, but also the people and the process and the data. So we'll look at, um, in, this, in this presentation, we'll look at some expert uh, views on the area and then delve into aspects of a costing system that sometimes are overlooked or, but do, that are, that are important. Um, lastly, I'll look at some trends, things that we've been seeing from, from our perspective and what people are looking in a costing system. So definitions first, what's meant by a costing system. Uh, the purpose is to provide insight into the cost of a proposal, an initiative, or an endeavor that requires investment. Cost is a measure of the resources required for that stated objective. Cost can be measured in dollars or euros, but also as uh, in terms of effort or schedule. Cost is not price, um, but understanding the cost often does feed a pricing decision. So the focus of this presentation is on systems that project cost. Estimating is a key part of that, but it's not the only thing. I, I will use the term costing and estimating somewhat interchangeably here. So don't think they're the one is that they're two really distinct things. Um, I just wanted to, costing is a broader term and sometimes costing is just getting known costs and bringing them together. Oftentimes that involves estimating. So costing uh, supports many, many activities. And what those activities all have in common 
is they are all about making decisions. They might be decisions about investment, uh, decisions about pricing, uh, or decisions about what business to go after, uh, decisions about prioritization of what projects you need to take on. All of these are important and an understanding of cost behind these decisions or behind the options are really important. And that's what the costing system will deliver to you. So looking at the elements, the key pieces of a costing system, I'm gonna break it down into four areas. Um, typically you think of just the tool or the application as a system, but I wanna kind of broaden that view. So the first is the people the stakeholders of the system. This is the day-to-day -day users uh, of the system, as well as maybe the incidental or casual users and those people who actually need to use the system for decision support. I wanna introduce the idea of process as a key aspect of the costing system. The process is the workflow, the guidelines, even the training associated with all the costing. And then data in, in the terms of costing, I think deserves its own sort of key element. Um, data is uh, really vital and I'm gonna have a few slides exactly on data. So I, I wanted to draw that out as a key element. And then lastly is the tooling. The tooling is the automation, the software and the interfaces used to streamline the whole system. Uh, the tooling also can add the, the, um, the controls onto the system as well. So as I had mentioned, I'm gonna kind of uh, throw out a few expert views on this. I've got three of them, as well as kind of our view at, at Gallarat. So the first one is uh, the Government Accounting Office. They offer a 12-step uh, estimation process. They have an excellent handbook. Um, you can find it on the web if you get the handouts to this presentation. Uh, this right here is a link to, to that guidebook. It's um, a few hundred pages, maybe three, almost 400 pages, and is really comprehensive and good. And, and the 12, their 12 process could be a whole webinar in and of itself. I'm just gonna bring up kind of the high points here. Um, now, the important thing is this 12 step process isn't a costing system in and of itself. However, you do want a costing system to support a rigorous process. Now your process may not be the 12 steps, it might be some variation on there, um, but this is a really good framework for identifying the key, key steps of a, of a costing process. So uh, the steps one through four, uh, the first couple of steps, um, defining the purpose and generating a plan, ideally should be somewhat pro, pro forma as part of the process, that is, when a costing is required, there should be some set of actions that put the process in place. Is there a formal standard, standard way that an estimate or a costing is requested? And if that is a request is granted, is, the estimate, is there an estimator assigned? All this is kind of the essential workflow helped by the technology, but is part of the process. Um, steps three and four, uh, technical baseline and building the estimating structure are about identifying the solution or the part or the system that you need to generate a cost for. This is developing a technical understanding and a view of the key system elements that need to be considered. Because estimation is often done early before there's a concrete design, this baseline and estimating uh, structure is often very notional. Okay, steps five through eight. Uh, ground rules and assumptions. The intent of this is to document all cost influencing assumptions that are made in, uh, in potential risks. It could be a, uh, as mundane as identifying your cost base year and your labor rates, but also can relate to the solution, um, assumptions about the solution. Next step, gathering data. Uh, the GAO cites different types of data. Uh, one is cost data itself actual historical costs. Um, the other is programmatic or scheduled data. This could be data um, about, you know, how many they want to build, what the time frame is, that sort of thing. And then technical data, which pertain to aspects of the, the system or solution. Um, they also make a point of storing the data to use for future estimates. And, and I'm going to talk about that, how keeping these archives is very important. Uh, next step, 
uh, this is pretty understated here, developing the point estimate. It's all about generating that, that key single point estimate um, from which uses a lot of different uh, estimating approaches and methods. And again, that's a very in-depth uh, section of that and talks about a lot of estimation methods. But I just want to kind of point that out that this is a step of process. The next one is the sensitivity analysis, which creates a range based on the potential changes in the assumptions or solution approaches. And then the last four steps, uh, risk and uncertainty analysis will leverage that point estimate that's generated and generate a confidence range around that or confidence levels around that range and evaluate different solution assumptions or approaches. Documenting the estimate. Ideally, this should occur throughout the process, but it's important, it's important to keep a tra paper trail. Imagine someone other than yourself picking up that estimate sometime later Will they be able to understand it? Will you be able to understand it? Uh, would they be able to recreate the estimate or use it as a basis for another estimate? Next step, uh, present to management. Um, again, ideally, if you followed this great process here and you have good substantiated uh, estimates with a lot of documentation, this should go uh, fairly smoothly. And of course, Present to management is pretty broad. You um, may be presenting to lots of different types of uh, folks and levels. Uh, adapt that to whatever the audience is. And then lastly is uh, update the estimate. Estimates are living entities in a way, and updating will always occur. So you always kind of think of the estimation as an iterative process. The next uh, expertise area I'm going to cite is Aberdeen Strategy and Research. It's a this is a consultancy that does survey-based research to determine attributes of best-in-class organizations. And they provided uh, key aspects of best-in-class cost, product cost management, and they highlight three areas. Uh, the first is to incorporate cost early, meaning you have the greatest opportunity to influence cost and optimize on cost if you know and understand it early and are able to capture that, particularly in the uh, looking at design alternatives. They use the term trust but verify, um, meaning you want to be able to have validated cost models. And also they talk a lot about feeding the cost models and cost data with live um, actual data wherever possible. And then lastly, uh, use the right tools, minimize your manual process is, um, and, and basically try to be as effective as possible and integrate those tools with other key data sources. They go um, further go on to quantify the custom companies that use these best in practice, pra best in practice processes are more likely to meet product cost targets, launch dates, and uh, objectives in uh, profit. Next, I want to um, cite Eric Hiller, who has, uh, he's a product cost management expert and has done a series of articles in the uh, publication Spend Matters. Um, this is his, his, his evaluations are focused mostly on the tool aspect, but he does recognize that tools um, become a bigger deployment and will differ from enterprise to enterprise. So the attributes that he brings forward to consider are the overall spend, what it's going to take, um, not only just the, say, licensing of the tools, but installation, training, integration, perhaps data migration, customization, and calibration. He brings up the idea of who can use the system and is it usable by non-experts. Certainly you're gonna have uh, experts and specialists at some level, but can a costing be used by non-specialists and really bring that maybe to a wider audience. Um, then the idea of efficiency. Turnaround of a costing is important, and it's important to measure this. Uh, you want to, if you're putting together a system, you want to be able to measure what some of your objectives are. And um, measuring the improvement in costing efficiency and generating a costing is one measure to do that. Um, transparency, 
Certainly, transparency relates to the ability to understand the flow and the calculations, but um, Eric Keller also looks at the ability to understand what is driving costs so that you can really do, say, your design to cost type of activity. Um, and then the fifth item is customization, considering both auto out of the box customization, such as adding parameters or defaults or maybe tuning the terminology, but potentially maybe even more um, advanced customizations, uh, maybe implementing custom, um, custom business rules or very specific data. And then lastly, professional services, implementing a tool to be part of a costing system requires expertise and support. So consider whether uh, professional services are available to support, support this. This could be for initial setup, but also uh, addressing long-term needs. All right, admittedly a little biased, I have added Galler's view of best practices uh, with respect to estimating. And as you can see, there's a good bit of alignment uh, with the other experts and what they talked about. Um, so going into this presentation, I'm going to go into depth on uh, several of these aspects of it and consider uh, things to consider when putting together a costing system. There's much to be said about the estimation methods, the you know, statistical approaches uh, that you're using, and that's all important. That's not going to be a big focus of this presentation. Um, I, what I want to bring up are kind of the other aspects in terms of uh, making a process go and work effectively in an organization. So this next slide um, is a little slight bit of a tangent, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Gallareth has developed a, a maturity model from estimation. And we would use it for organizations that are seeking to improve their processes to help them understand where they're at and where they want to go. Um, this particular model here is focused on software estimation. You can see it talks about um, software size metrics and things like that. But this idea really can apply to um, other domains as well. Okay, so looking at components of a best-in-class cost system, I think first and foremost is it's got to have confidence. A healthy costing system is one that maintains the confidence of the stakeholders. Loss of confidence will mean that people will work around the system and ultimately the system will degrade. This doesn't mean just the accuracy of the cost models or CERs, that's, that is important, but it also means that the data used is credible, the techniques are verified, the people um, that are producing it know what they're doing, and that the system overall has good governance. The last thing you want to do is create an estimate and no one believes it because it just no one really has trust in the system. So oftentimes before you maybe have a rigorous costing system, there's this idea of tribal knowledge, um, which are really kind of the heroes and the, the people that have a lot of good information. Um, the benefits of this people of this tribal, tribal knowledge is that they've been part of an organization oftentimes for a long time and have great insight information. Uh, an expert can bring great insight into the effort of time it might be required for a particular project or endeavor. This is because they've seen a lot of projects, maybe they know the technology, Maybe they know the nuances of a, of a legacy system that they have to work with. A good costing system will leverage that knowledge, but an excellent costing system will harness that knowledge so that it can be used by everyone. Relying on individuals creates a system that's vulnerable and will degrade, again, if those individuals leave. So capturing that expertise is really important. And the antidote to relying on the heroes or the tribal knowledge are these, this idea of keeping repositories. And, and, and we advocate for a few different components of the repositories. Certainly historical data, uh, cost data is important. This covers the cost, effort, and schedule of a system or component or part in a, in a um, completed state. How many hours did it take 
uh, what was the cost, how long did it take. And then along with that is the technical data. This contains information as of the as-built system in terms of its key components, including a qualitative description, descriptive information, and quantitative metrics. Um, this may or may not be a distinct repository from the historical cost data. That, that's not as important, but what is important is that you do collect this information and that you use this to qualify the cost data. And then the, um, the other one is the actual cost estimate costing repository, a repository of cost estimates that you've done. The collection of costings offers a valuable, in, uh, valuable data that can be used as an archive, just so you have a record of things, but also helps to determine, uh, helps in building estimating templates and patterns to improve uh, future estimates. And I'll be talking a little bit about later on about uh, what information needs to be captured in, in, as a part of those estimates. So um, the pace of estimating, you're big, sometimes you do very few, but big estimates, sometimes you do lots and lots of little estimates. Uh, the GAO process that I discussed a little bit early, earlier is really geared towards maybe larger, more complicated systems. And the estimating process will require lots of people and oftentimes many disciplines. But not all costings um, are a multi-person endeavor. Sometimes they're, um, it just takes one person in an afternoon to do it. The costing system should take uh, this pace and scope into account in terms of how it's set up. In a high volume costing environment, non-costing professionals will likely be key users. They, they'll need to be supported by experts who set up templates and patterns to offer default inputs. So the non-experts can estimate both efficiently and accurately. So I, I can't have a um, talk about costing systems without mentioning spreadsheets. I, I recently read an article um, in the CFO uh, website about why Excel persists in finance departments. And, and the reasons they cited why it survives is it's universal. Everyone knows it. It's affordable. Um, you probably have it with your, if you have Microsoft accounts. Um, it's functional. It can do a lot of things. And, um, and they keep innovating it. There's things that they do to keep um, making it better. But it does have drawbacks. There's a lot of potential for errors. And it doesn't really scale, scale well. So in terms of a costing system, um, spreadsheets should be part of the toolbox. However, it should not be the centerpiece of the toolbox. Um, it should be used where effective as a supplement. And examples of that would be um, maybe, maybe uh, you know, specialized calculations um, or what I would call a sandbox estimate, uh, something that you want to do kind of off to the side. You may not necessarily want to um, commit it to the, the whole estimating process, or you want to say, yeah, I did this estimate. It's not standard, but here it is. So again, it shouldn't be the centerpiece, but you can't if, if you say, no, we can't have Excel as part of the system, that's probably not going to work well either. And of course, talking about Excel, it doesn't, uh, talking about errors, um, errors in a costing system. Errors, of course, are confidence killers. Um, obviously, you want a system to be error-free. Uh, however, costing is a complex process. It's got lots of stakeholders, certain sources of data, and can be vulnerable to errors. Um, so I'm going to look at, I kind of have a, a few, from a costing perspective, uh, sources of errors and things you can do to um, minimize them. Like I say, I don't think you can necessarily reduce them entirely, but you certainly can minimize them. So the first one is poor data management. Costing, of course, uses lots of data, and the data that should be used should have some sort of control or management behind it. For instance, things as simple as the inflation tables need to be up to date and accurate and historical data used to generate a costing relationship should be managed so that access is controlled and there's no question as to the integrity of the data. So the remedy here is to manage and control your data. Um, this is often done maybe for the big databases, but 
make sure you have um, controls and management over simple things like your inflation factors, exchange rates, your labor rate catalogs, and things like that. Um, another source of errors in the, an estimate is bad assumptions. The methodology that you may be using is really good, but the, if the assumptions going in are poor, that's going to cause problems with the estimate. So um, basically, the best things to get around that are to capture that technical data so that you do have the best assumptions. Capture past costings as examples so that people have uh, frameworks to work from, so they're not just working from scratch. And also cost from source data wherever possible. So the other area of, of um, potential errors are errors in the logic or the calculations um, somewhere in the compute cycle. Uh, this could be a misprogrammed learning curve, uh, maybe a bad conversion of units, or a problem in how costs roll up. So the remedies, the way to try to avoid that are certainly first and foremost to validate calculations and then control how calculations, um, who and how can change the rules and, and how the, the calculations say who, who can change the CER. Um, I would also want to mention use trusted vendors who we do a lot of independent validation. Testing is a big part of what we do with our products um, to ensure that, you know, when we say we add these things up, the numbers are what they say. And then lastly, um, data entry errors. As long as someone's going to type in data, there's errors that can happen. This could be just a simple typo or maybe transpose numbers. It happens. Um, or it could be formatting. You know, do you put in 100 for 100%, like 100, or do you put in 1? Um, so the, the biggest remedy to that is minimize the manual data entry. Require a minimum of manual inputs. Also, make use of pre-entered defaults and highlight changes uh, as possible. And then I want to bring in the idea of a review process to catch issues. Um, reviews are used in software code reviews to catch errors. It's the same idea here. And again, if the system highlights changes that, uh, that were maybe changed from default, that makes that review process a lot easier. Okay, so the technical baseline, um, this is an important part of uh, having the process that you do the technical baseline and ground rules and assumptions. Um, the golden rule of estimating is to know what it is so that you have a basis of, of building an estimate. Now, obviously, an estimate, not everything is known. Um, there needs to be some sort of notional concept defined some sort of, it could be a drawing, it could be a diagram, it could be a block diagram, and where there are unknowns uh, about what these components are or maybe how they're built, you need a way to fill in assumptions. And repeat as required. And the purpose of this slide is kind of to talk about the workflow of the costing system and that you need to have a system that supports different gateways. And they may not necessarily be these. This is just kind of a kind of a basic example. But recognize that estimates change, things will get updated, and it needs to go through that cycle. All um, in every time you go through there, there could be an estimate change. So you want to say, you know, does an estimate get started? How is that triggered? Someone gets assigned to it. They do an estimate, it goes through a review, um, and it might be reviewed. It might go back to say, you know, this isn't right or that isn't right anyway. And ultimately, it might go on for approval. And in fact, it might even go on further, um, you know, if you won the proposal or if you, you know, or if the project got greenlit. And you may want to track that through its life cycle. I think what's really important here is that you keep all these revisions and you tag your estimates as to what these statuses are in going through this, this gateway. Um, again, if you just have an Excel file and you know, it keeps getting updated, sometimes you don't know when the latest one, what was the latest revision, what was, uh, you know, has this gone through the review, have, have the right people looked at it first. So look at that, support a system that, um, or build a system that supports this cyclic nature, 
and the fact that you do want to keep track of different gateways and maybe even different gateways at different life cycle phases. So data collection, um, a good system will uh, foster the collection of data to be used for future estimates. So again, I kind of talked about some of these a little bit before. Um, the costing is, is, you know, you want to do the costing. That's going to be supported by the historical repository. And here, this also includes, um, to some extent, the technical data, but also the estimating repository. So the estimate repository will provide a basis uh, for exemplars and templates to be used for future costings. This enforces consistency and comparability. The historical data can serve the costing process by providing reference and analogy data, and it can also be used for creating and updating um, and calibrating models. So a good costing system will connect all these sources so they can be um, leveraged. And document everything. Um, it's super easy to work a spreadsheet and get some numbers that you need. However, what will that mean to someone who doesn't, hasn't seen it before? Or what will it mean to you, the costing professional, several months later? Um, if you can't follow it, then there might there be missing information. Um, where did that model input come from? Where did that labor, how was that labor rate determined? A good costing system will allow you to keep a narrative for each estimated element as well as each input. And I've gotten this far, um, and I haven't mentioned anything about estimating methods. Um, so I do want to put this in here. Um, estimating, there's lots of methods that can, can be used, bottoms up, parametric, um, activity-based costing. A good toolbox will not rely on just one method. In fact, a lot of complex estimates, um, by their very nature, will use multiple methods. Uh, there's a time and a place for different approaches, and honestly, the approaches really have probably more in common than not, in that um, an estimate is oftentimes just an adjustment off of some reference point. Now, that adjustment can be done through judgment um, or a factor, or it can be done through statistical methods. And like I say, I think there are a time and a place for everything in in there might be key components of your estimate where you want to use um, parametrics, but a lot of things that are straightforward were just rates and factors. You know, I've got X number of trips and they're going to cost this much per trip or, um, you know, where you just basically want the, the rate and quantity. And maybe you have some uncertainty on the, you know, the quantities and you can incorporate that as part of your estimate. So again, you want to be able to um, make use of different methods and use the methods that are most appropriate at, for whatever task at hand. And controls, and I've really hinted at this, Can the integrity of the costs and the data are important and critical to the system gaining the confidence of the stakeholders. So um, there are control, various levels of control, control over say who can do different activities, who can create um, and update costings or estimates, as well as who can uh, create and update estimating, say, uh, the data or the templates that are used. This is kind of where the processing and the tooling intersect. So you want a, a system that has good governance and controls over these key pieces. And I do want to say um, it, it certainly needs to be enforceable, uh, but you, you don't want to make it so onerous that people just skirt around the system. So. Um, again, I, I mentioned the idea of a sandbox estimate. Maybe someone doesn't have the access to do it, but if they can do a sandbox estimate and maybe not make an official commitment to the process, that's sort of a, a way to make it easier, easier to go forward. Um, and then at some point it could catch up to the maybe perhaps more rigorous process. Okay, adaptability and flexibility. Um, the world moves fast and, you know, things change, technology changes, and estimating approaches changes. A costing system really does need to have the agility to change and evolve over time. And this happens at a couple of levels. One is um, 
the set of procedures and templates used, there needs to be a process to keep those up to date and current. You know, as soon as you publish a CER, you need to think about how is it going to be maintained? Is it going to be updated? It's not always a one and done kind of thing. The second level is there needs to be some ability to deviate from the standard templates. Because if everything was standard, we could completely automate the process, right? Um, so you want to, I know this kind of goes against a little bit of that repeatability, but there needs to be a process and uh, room to grow and improve and say, hey, here's this template, but I think I want to make it, you know, make it a little bit better. And you want to say, you know, how much can you customize? Can you add parameters? Can you add lists or maybe even custom business rules? This is how a system kind of grows and evolves. And, and I'm not saying it needs to be the wild, wild west, but have a, a way for people to introduce improvements to the process. Okay, next I'm going to um, kind of wrap it up with some of the, what we call, what I call trends and costing things, um, what people have been seeking out. Uh, this is our view based on, say, RFI and RFP inquiries that we receive from um, many, many organizations around the world, as well as even from our clients. <clears throat> so first and foremost, um, organizations are seeking cloud solutions. They want a system that's pretty much ready to go, that doesn't require a lot of IT budget or assistance to set up. Um, I do want to say that this is mostly um, with new prospects and that because costing is sensitive, obviously where the data lives and security are um, important considerations and having it in the cloud is not necessarily a universal desire, but certainly is something we've seen more of lately. The next is uh, model-driven costing. Uh, this is a big area in the manufacturing world where we're costing from 3D models, but we're also doing uh, hooking cost models in as part of a model-based systems engineering environment uh, to look at, say, adding cost into um, a design performance type of trade-off. Uh, financial granularity. At one point in time, it was just enough to say, here's a cost, or here's the hours, or maybe a top-level cost. Um, now, we're, there is a desire to get into more specific financial aspects of, of the, the estimation. Um, they want to adapt specific uh, rate cards or labor rate catalogs, along with other financial data. Um, looking at profit, looking at, um, we have one customer even looking at um, margins as a part of this. Uh, workflow support, and I've talked a lot about that and how workflow is an important aspect of the costing system. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of desire to uh, support the workflow, uh, the different roles and responsibilities uh, is a part of the costing system. And I think something that's important here is that every company is a little bit different. Every organization is going to set it up a little bit different. They want costing systems to adapt to whatever their workflow is. Uh, in knowledge capture, organizations don't always want to start from scratch. They want a kind of to see their work with a, a set of rules and data to start with, but then they want to adapt it and, and um, you know, add their own. The other one is collaboration. Again, uh, you know, it used to be if we just gave them a cost that was enough and it was up to them to uh, go out and share it. They're looking more to uh, provide the means to circulate and, and get the, um, the cost data out amongst the shareholders. Modeling help, um, building models, and they want help building models and selecting key drivers, you know, more guidance on, you know, if I have this part, what is the most effective way to go about machining it or what is most likely to be used on there. Um, auditing, like keeping track of changes between revisions uh, of estimates to help understand what those cost estimates, uh, what those cost changes are. Also uh, throw in error checking there. Um, and reporting at both high and low levels. Um, you know, more detail at kind of a single estimate view 
as well as reporting across multiple estimates or multiple costings. And then lastly, what I would call kind of uh, adaptive reporting to provide maybe specific BOE basis of estimate guidance or cost reporting uh, for a specific and counting formats on there. So with that, I, I want to thank everyone for attending. That kind of wraps up the, uh, the core, the bulk of this presentation. I hope I've imparted some helpful knowledge uh, for you. And I guess we will um, make a pivot to the Q&A. Right. Thank you, Karen. Um, mm -hmm. Before we dive into the Q&A, I just want to let everybody know that a link to the post-event survey was dropped in the chat. So if you can take a moment and um, click on that. And also remember that a, a PDF version of today's presentation deck will be available um, at galbraith.live. And there's a link to galbraith.live at the end of the survey. Um, okay, go ahead and submit any questions you might have using the Q&A button. And um, we'll go ahead and open up to answer your questions. So let's see. Um, our first question is, uh, how do you get started building a costing system? Um, well, it's probably unusual to be starting completely from scratch unless it's a brand new company. Um, my, my advice would be to start off and ask yourself, what, you know, what are our objectives? What do we want to get done? Um, and, and what are maybe the shortcomings of the existing system or methods that we're using? So you might, you may want to improve costing turnaround time by 50%, or you might want to improve accuracy, or maybe you want to decentralize the costing. I would say get started by understanding what your objectives are. And then once you have the objective stated, you can start thinking of, okay, well, what, what do we need to do? You know, do we need to look at, is it a, a matter of training? Is it a matter of tools? Is it a matter of, um, you know, process? And think of all those things as well as the data going in there. Um, if you're starting from complete greenfield, um, you know, with nothing in place, uh, which is probably very unusual, but if, if that is the case, um, certainly I would turn to, obviously presentations like this would be really helpful, and, and, and then talk to uh, companies that offer solutions on there to see what, what they could do. Um, they, I, I, one thing I will say is that when we get RFPs and RFIs, um, we know we've seen a lot of deployments and things like that. So there's a lot of things that they may not know to ask as part of uh, their desires. So, so talk to vendors, talk to maybe other companies. Um, uh, I, I see a organiz professional organizations and find out what they're doing. Okay, thank you. Uh, what have you seen in terms of design to cost implementations? And then also on that, um, could you recommend any materials that provide guidance toward developing a design to cost implementation or even just portions of that process? Um, I'm not sure I, I could, I would say the, my, my basic biggest exposure in that is looking um, at the CAD to cost uh, capabilities and in, incorporating that very early um, so that you can, you know, affect design changes on there. So um, that, that's kind of the key tenant of that as far as building an overall practice. Um, I would probably look at some, uh, you know, design to cost expertise, but, but certainly from a costing perspective, um, you know, I would certainly advocate to say, you know, come up with a system where you're using your, your um, solid models to drive that costing. Um, let's see. Um, do you recommend commercial parametric models or bespoke CERs? Uh, well, I'll probably give a, a mealy mouth answer to that and say I, I recommend using the method that is best for you and the information you have and the, the challenge or uh, estimate that you need to do. Um, commercial models are really effective at um, providing a general cost modeling uh, framework and that you can model most anything. Um, 
whereas a bespoke CER has a lot more, uh, what I would say, boundaries around it in terms of the ranges it, it could be perhaps applied to. However, if you have a CER that really fits what you're doing, that might be um, the best way to do it. And of course, there's no reason why you can't do both and you know look at both approaches. Okay. Um, okay, missing gaps, uh, I'm sorry, missing data, gaps in data, outliers, data reliability, uh, questionable correlation. These are all the bane of making a cost estimate. You touched on this, but what can you predict on the future of cost systems helping compensate for these banes? You know, that, that's a really good question. And there's a lot of work in, uh, that our company is doing you know, in terms of um, machine learning and, um, you know, basically looking at some advanced methods to maybe help fill in those gaps or, you know, uh, avoid the outliers and things like that. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a challenge. And like you say, it's sort of the bane of, uh, you know, ha having imperfect data is kind of what we live with and uh, looking to some more advanced methods might help that. Okay. Um, could you answer how does SEER, SEER for hardware, what, do they, what does it do to keep up to date? Um, there are, there, there's, I'll call it big things and little things. Um, certainly the basics are, you know, we have a process for keeping labor rates and uh, inflation tables and exchange rates up to date um, and a process for incorporating that into the application. Um, then there's the knowledge bases and modeling data. Um, knowledge bases are updated or oftentimes we add new ones to reflect say new modeling scenarios. Um, and then we up and, and update the um, the mapping data that we use, which is kind of the reference data on there. And that becomes part of a major update cycles. Uh, last year, we had a really big update to CRH that addresses many new electronics technologies and also, also offers kind of a newer framework so that um, we can add new technologies into the, the modeling framework um, as, as our knowledge grows. Thank you. <clears throat> what is the best way to build costing systems for early design stages when you do when you do not have the drawings or the 3D models, um, but you have many layouts and configurations? Um, it's great if you do have the 3D models, but you want a system that will uh, start building things even if you uh, where you can start analyzing them even if you don't have those models and the best way to do that is have something where you can say, okay, I don't have a model. However, I, you know, maybe I have a drawing, um, I can get dimensions and things like that. And as long as you can uh, make that, you know, an input to the system and uh, you can do the costing as well. Um, I know in our uh, manufacturing, Zephyr manufacturing, we do not require a 3D model. It's great if you have it, but it's absolutely not required. Um, it, there's a robust modeling environment where you can describe um, your parts and do your design to cost without the models. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, let's see here, another one coming in. Uh, what's the earliest early you have seen an organization embed cost into the process, process prior SOP, prior launch, prior bid, et cetera? Um, this happens, uh, you know, that slide I had a little bit earlier where, you know, you have to lots of um, cost, lots of little cost estimates or some really big ones. Um, there are organizations that need to reply to uh, legislative inquiries and provide the cost impacts of, say, a, a legislative change. Um, and so th that has to start really early when it's just some, you know, legislature's concept. So uh, there, there's really, you know, it, it can be done and we, we've done estimates at, you know, certainly pre-proposal like planning, planning stages where, you know, there isn't even a, um, an RFP out, you know, so it, it can be done very early. 
Um, obviously, the efficacy of the estimates get better as the solutions get better defined and you have better ground rules. But again, they talk about the whole costing as a system. Um, you know, something can be encoded as a concept estimate, a, you know, maybe there's one what's where you have general system requirements estimate and it can get better and better and you can refine it and keep different revisions of it. Um, how often do you update the SEER material pricing, the material any files? Um, they get updated uh, with major, when we release major updates on there. Um, in fact, we're very close. We're going to be putting one out soon in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Great. Thank you. I don't see any more new questions coming in. So if you do have a question, um, something comes to you after this presentation, you'll feel free to email us and we can answer your questions. And um, I just want to thank everybody for attending today. And to remember to click on that exit survey link in the chat window where you can give feedback on today's ses session and then also give suggestions for a May topic. I'm looking for input from you on that. And also don't forget to um, answer the questions. It'll be entered into that $100 Amazon gift card uh, pool of people. So also remember to check Galarath Live for the upcoming webinar information and to get the PDF from this presentation and the video links. Um, and that's it. So if you like, I'm going to leave the webinar window open a little bit longer so you can have a moment to click on those links. And again, thank you for attending today. Thank you, Thanks, Karen. Thanks, everybody.